this talk is really about uh, topics in the area of uh, statistical inference. Now, we would all like to be logical, and uh, our introduction to extremely logical reasoning is through Euclidean geometry, or if you take a formal course in logic, Aristotle and his various syllogisms. But that kind of thing doesn't often work in the real world, because uh, we deal with situations where we may not have a precise yes or no answer, and the answer may lie somewhere in between. So if you take impossible to be zero and uh, certain to be one, many of the things lie between zero and one. And this introduces the notion of uh, probability. Okay. So uh, the two thinkers mentioned in the title thought a lot about probability. And in some sense, they came up with ideas which I would like to describe on how one reasons in such a situation. Now, it turned out, so they really date back to the uh, late 18th century, early 19th century. And then there seems to be a long period in which uh, these ideas were in cold storage. And suddenly, uh, somewhat independently, in around 1950, from a very unexpected source, namely a telephone company, Bell Telephone Laboratories in the United States, uh, a new set of ideas, apparently a new set of ideas came up, which uh, go by the name of information theory. Okay? And that's very much associated with the name of a person called Claude Shannon, about whom I'll be telling you something. And information theory initially was restricted to the domain of, say, a telephone or telegraph or wireless communication. But it has uh, spread its tentacles very wide. And what is interesting is that uh, not Shannon himself, he was rather conservative, but other people have uh, tried to push it to a wider domain, including statistical inference. So these two streams have kind of merged. And uh, I have myself had occasion to use these ideas. They are quite prevalent in astronomy. Although uh, orthodox statisticians have been a little reluctant to embrace them, or rather they're divided into two bitterly warring schools, some of whom believe in it. They are the so-called Bayesians, and then the others who don't. So my idea is to go over all this. and. Uh, so the first interesting thing, let's, following the famous film director who said that every story should have you know, a beginning, a middle, and an end, but not necessarily in that order. So let me begin with the middle, which is the middle of the 20th century, uh, with Shannon's concept of information. And he came up uh, with a concept which is hard to quarrel with. That if you receive a message, and you already knew what the message contained, then you have not really gained any information. So if you did not know what the message contained, a simple case is that it could have had two possible answers, okay, or it could have, and then you've gained an amount of information which corresponds to that two. And likewise, if the number of possible answers increases, right, and then you gain one of them as the answer, your information gain is correspondingly more. Okay. So if you have a measure of your ignorance before the message was received, the same measure will serve as a measure of your enlightenment after the message is received. And in some sense, that is what you pay for. That's what you pay your mobile company for when you get so many bits or so many gigabits or megabits. Okay? And we'll, we'll go into a little more detail in that. This definition, which we'll come to, actually underlines, uh, underlines a lot of our information and communication technology today. It's also theoretically appealing, which is why other people took it further. And it turned out, when people thought about it, that it connected nicely with this Bayesian school of thought, which had been lying dormant for a long time. And uh, therefore, its scope became a little wider. And uh, certainly in the natural sciences, it's quite widespread. My understanding is that people in the social sciences get more intimidated by mathematical statistics. And therefore, whatever the statisticians tell them, they sort of accept it and go ahead. But I think it's still interesting to <coughs> expose this group to this alternative mode of thinking. Now, what was somewhat unexpected and happened in the late uh, 20th century uh, is that up to that time, it was a practical issue. You know, how do you deal with you know, predicting the next monsoon or you know, assessing whether a particular treatment really is more effective than another treatment? Those are practical issues from which a fundamental physicist might stay quite aloof. 
but uh, there is also uncertainty at the level of atoms and nuclei, and that uncertainty has refused to go away. Uh, some of you might have heard the name of Heisenberg, who introduced an uncertainty principle. And people have uh, grappled with this, and we'll come at the end to one viewpoint that perhaps we have to live with this. Okay? And it has a rather drastic consequence that uh, our belief in an objective external world, which is out there, is uh, somewhat eroded. So I'll try and go over this ground. And as I promised you in the abstract, uh, I will touch upon a little bit the part which I personally worked on. So here is uh, uh, the definition of one bit of information. It's a situation which many of us have been, and I was 30 years ago. So you're standing in the corridor of Philomena's hospital, and the nurse is holding a bundle, and this is before the days of ultrasound. So it's a question which could have two answers, right? And roughly equally probable, okay, except in some states of our nation which shall remain nameless. Okay. So uh, this quantity W, which is the number of alternatives which are equally probable, is two. And this is one bit of information. Of course, you normally think of the bit in a computer as a location which carries a zero or a one, but this is really the same thing. You could encode this information by saying that if it's a boy, it is zero, and if it's a girl, it's one. Okay. But let's then ask, after all, I wasn't the only person standing in Philomena's hospital. There are many wards. So suppose six nurses <laughs> emerged from the six wards. What are the number of possible answers to the questions raised by these six uh, anxious fathers? Uh, each one of them could have two answers, and for each of those, the next one could have two answers. So you should really be multiplying two into two into two six times, or two raised to the power of six. So 64. Uh, so this W is slightly inconvenient, because what we would really like to say is that there are six bits of information. After all, if we encoded one birth by a zero or a one, a string of zeros or ones, six of them, would successfully encode the outcome in the hospital, all right? So really, we should not look at 64, but we should look at the power of two. So, uh, so here are the pioneers, the Shannon, essentially lived through most of the 20th century. And on the right, I have put, he was completely trained as an electrical engineer, though a very versatile one. And uh, the other is a kind of maverick uh, physicist who became one of the strongest advocates of this uh, Bayesian school of thought. So whatever I have showed you in the previous picture has now been generalized a little bit. Again, sticking to equally probable alternatives, if the number is 2 raised to some power, to 6, it could be 10, anything, then the number of bits is really the power to which you should raise 2 in order to get w. And w is just the number of options, still keeping them equally probable. Okay. So, uh, for example, a message which consists of you know, 10 ones and zeros, you can ask how many such possible messages are there, and the answer will be 2 raised to 10, which is about 1024. Incidentally, in the digital world, 1k does not mean 1000, it means 1024. Okay, it's a curious fact. <laughs> now, I was wondering whether to introduce the logarithm in this lecture, I mean, enough to scare some people off, including a good fraction of our students in SLS. But in any case, the same the, the power to which you have to raise to is called the logarithm. Okay. Now, of course, uh, uh, Shannon called this the entropy, okay. the number of bits. And uh, apparently, the history is that he wanted to know what to call it. So he went to a famous physicist who told him, call it entropy because no one understands entropy anyway. <laughs> so, so you can win any debate. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, this is clearly an extreme situation. If you, if you take a message in English, not all the symbols have equal probabilities. Okay? I think E is the most probable, then perhaps T or A. So you need a generalization, and this was provided by Shannon, a situation where the probabilities are not equal. I'm not going to inflict that on you, but it's enough for us to know that there is such a generalization. In fact, in the beginning of his paper, he actually takes English text as an example to compute the number of bits in a typical section of English text. And for that, you need to know not only how often these occurs, you need one more generalization. Uh, these are not independent. In the case of the six births in the six wards, they were independent. No matter what happened in one ward, both options were equally probable in the other ward. But in English, if you see a queue, 
you can be uh, pretty sure that it will be followed by a U. I mean, unless it's the cricket score of the Bangladesh team, in which case you might find a few Qs without Us following them. Okay? And you need a generalization to unequal probabilities. So I'll just give you an example. If the probabilities are one fourth and three fourths, this formula, which I have not written down, will tell you that the information contained in it is actually less than one bit. Okay? What that means, we will come to. It says it is 0.8 bits. Okay? You can see that this is a, it makes sense for it to come down, because take the extreme when the probabilities are, say, 1% and 99%. And most of the time, you're going to get a 1. Let us say the probability of 0 is 1% and the probability of 1 is 99%. Most of the time, you're going to get a 1. And you're so confident you're going to get a 1 that it doesn't really tell you anything. Of course, rare occasions, you'll be surprised you'll get a 0. So the net result is that uh, you have, oh, OK. No, I, I saw a hand up you know, since I teach an undergraduate class. But you're, you're not asking me a question. No? OK, fine. <laughs> right. Um, yes. So all we have right now is a definition. And the definition has a nice property of additivity. If you have two messages, this quantity, which we call W, gets multiplied, but our number of bits adds. Now, ultimately, a definition has to be useful. And I think Shannon's genius is, number one, coming up with a definition, and number two, making good use of it. Okay. So take this example of uh, two symbols which have a 3 fourth 1 fourth property. If you really believe that definition, and you have a message of 100 symbols, then Shannon tells you the actual information content in it is not 100 bits, but 80 bits. If that is really so, you should be able to modify the message. You should be able to code it in such a way that you can actually compress it. Now, again, compression is something that today we are all familiar with. You take a file, if you think it's too big, you run it through something called gzip, and it gets compressed. Now, basically, compression works because of uh, what you might call uh, redundant information. Compression is even more spectacular in the case of uh, pictures. So a movie, a movie frame is really a huge object, if you think about it. It has got uh, megapixels. Okay? So, and then if you have 24 frames per second, and 3,600 3, frames in an hour, it could quickly become a very big file. But actually, the movie files are rather small. And the reason is, one is, each picture itself, the pixels are not independent. You might have just a lot of blue sky in which case it could be compressed. The computer could just say, take this area and make it blue. And the second thing is, the next picture is not totally different from the first. So instead of storing the second picture, you could simply say, you know, make the following modifications to the first picture, and that's a much more concise way of expressing what is happening in the movie. Okay? So compression is the fact of life. Now, the nice thing is that Shannon's definition of entropy or information tells you exactly how much you can compress something. So uh, English, for example, is compressible. And the proof is, of course, the SMS English, where you know, the person takes normal English, converts into an SMS English, and then you read it, and you can convert it back into normal English. Until the time comes when you start thinking in SMS English, which happens to some of our students. Okay? But there's another problem. See, Shannon was not only concerned with coding and compression. He was also concerned with the transmission of information. And this is, again, an issue which needs no explanation in the age of mobile telephony. Uh, someone speaks something at the other end, and what you hear at this end is uh, perhaps has some resemblance to what that person spoke, but also has a whole lot of extra noise added to it. Okay? So he did a deep analysis of how much information can be transmitted over a channel in the presence of noise. And so in other words, if there are errors, you need a mechanism to correct the errors. So again, I've chosen a rather lighthearted example, uh, which comes from days which are now long gone by, the greetings telegrams. So I think most of the people here <laughs> may be old enough to remember greetings telegrams. And you had to pay by the word. So there was no point in saying, may heaven's choicest blessings be showered on the young couple. You instead said, uh, greetings 10. Okay? And likewise, congratulations on the arrival of the newborn baby would be greetings 11. Now that's fine. However, if the person transmitting the message had a strange tendency of adding or subtracting one from the greetings, then that could result in a bit of a disaster, right? Congratulating the couple who's getting married on the arrival of their baby. Okay? So how would one solve this problem? This is an artificial problem that 
either by neglect or by malice, the telegraph operator <laughs> randomly adds or subtracts one from your greeting number. So the error correcting code would be the following. You would say there's a greetings one, and then you would be very careful, and the next uh, uh, thing would be probably uh, greetings four. Okay. So four at most could become three or five. One could become two. So there's no risk of these two getting confused, even if this man likes to make this mistake. right? So this is called an error correcting code. You don't use all the symbols. You uh, deliberately uh, say, we only go to have a greetings one, uh, a greetings four, and then you leave a gap of two, and five, six, greetings seven, and so on. So it really means that, but of course, what the person receives may not be one, four, or seven. You may receive two, but you know that if this person is reasonable and doesn't add more than one, then uh, you can correct it back to one. If you receive greetings three, you know that what was originally transmitted was four. Of course, sometimes the person may also transmit four. So this is an example of what is called an error correcting code. The price you pay for an error correcting code is that you have to use many more symbols than the ones that you would have to use if there were no errors. So that limits the capacity of your channel. Now, intuitively, of course, it didn't take a genius to do this. Where his uh, special uh, contribution came, and which really surprised his contemporaries, was that he could prove two theorems. Now, again, theorem is a word which I, I thought <laughs> might intimidate the audience. But what is interesting is that what was just an intuitive idea could be converted to a mathematical proof. Namely, he could tell you that uh, if a message had uh, an entropy of so much, it could be compressed this much and not further. And second, if the channel had so much noise and your signal strength was so much, and you know I'm deliberately being a little vague here, but these can be precisely defined, he would give you an exact formula saying, you can carry this many telephone conversations on it. Now what is probably happening is that our operators are trying to violate this limit, <laughs> which is why we're getting all these dropped calls and, right? So given a certain bandwidth, and given a certain power in your mobile transmitters, there's a certain number of uh, conversations which you can carry, interestingly, without error. In spite of the fact that errors are introduced in the transmission process, because you can code it in such a way that the errors can be corrected. And it has to be a little cleverer than the example I gave you. Now, interestingly, uh, mathematical theorems are of two kinds. One is called constructive, where you actually show. The other is what is called existential. In which case, you show there must be a solution, but you don't actually find the solution. So fortunately, Shannon gave an existential proof. So it, it was left to generations of electrical engineers to actually come up with the precise schemes by which they could approach the Shannon limit. Okay. So in other words, and the crucial input, now you can never get an output without an input. The crucial input was you must know all the characteristics of the information source. So if it is English, you should know something about the frequencies of the letters, the frequencies of various combinations of letters, and so on. And of course, this information can be gathered by a study of English texts. Likewise, you must know all the characteristics of the channel, namely the noise, and so on. But that is the job of good engineers to do. And uh, as I stated in the abstract, this is something we now take for granted. Now, mobile conversations are not that great. On the other hand, if you get an SMS message or you, know, you download a file, Pretty much most of the time it's uncorrupted, even though it's coming over the same corrupt channel. And that is precisely because the protocol for transmitting it has this inbuilt protection against errors, uh, which is guaranteed by the work of Shannon. Okay. So I won't say uh, much more about uh, Shannon and his entropy and so on. But what we do see is that there is some role for a prior knowledge about the phenomenon which you're studying. So even if you go back to our original example of the bit. Your question was not, your ignorance was not of a completely general nature. There was a specific question, it had a specific number of answers, and they had specific probabilities, and your ignorance was reflected in those probabilities. So there is not something like total ignorance where you don't even know what the question is. Okay. So within such a framework, where you have a well-defined set of answers, thinking like this works. Now I want to actually take, go a couple of, maybe three centuries back, <laughs> So the notions of probability, which were well developed by the time of Shannon, it's interesting to ask how they originated. And actually, uh, if one thinks about it, there are at least 
three different definitions of probability, and they actually remain even to the present day. Okay? So this is Pascal, whom many of you may have heard of. Uh, mathematicians know him as a mathematician. Philosophers know him as a philosopher. He's apparently very versatile. He proved a theorem with 100 corollaries, and then therefore decided that mathematics was too simple and took to philosophy. Now, it turned out that in addition, in collaboration with another mathematician called uh, Fermat, uh, they were consulted by uh, one of the well-known gamblers of that time, who noted various regularities in statistical regularities in gambling games and asked these gentlemen to explain it. And of course, they were able to explain it by simply counting, saying the number of ways in which some one alternative can happen, say getting a total of nine on three dice or something like that, and the number of ways in which some other alternative could happen. So probability as introduced by them was an exercise in counting. Some of the counting problems could have been hard, but still uh, an exercise in counting the total number of ways in the denominator and the number of ways that your outcome, your favorite outcome would occur in the numerator. So that was the beginning of probability. Meanwhile, uh, across the English Channel, a totally different kind of environment, you have this gentleman called uh, Francis Galton, uh, cousin of Charles Darwin. And his approach, uh, he's considered as the father of modern statistics. Because his whole idea was to survey, go out, and sample. And the species in which he was most interested, unlike his cousin, was the human species. So he went out, went out and gathered all kinds of data. He also introduced some of these measures of intelligence, which are still controversial. He also believed in eugenics. The idea that, uh, he, in fact, he suggested that governments must first maybe have something like an exam, and people who rank high in this exam should be paid money to marry each other. And, right? So very interesting character. Okay? But he did introduce this methodology of large surveys and statistics. And though he was not himself a very powerful mathematician, he could bring in other mathematicians. So now statistics acquires, probability acquires an empirical character. You actually go out, do a survey. Uh, if you are sufficiently patient, you can survey the whole population. And you can get your figure of how many people are below five feet in height, or whether people you know, are shorter in this county than in that county. You can answer questions like this. And I think social science continues to worry about such questions at the present time. In practice, you sample. And we will come back to sampling later. The third uh, concept of probability was what you might call uh, rational decision making or degree of belief. Okay? And this is somewhat different. Uh, but we all use it. You know, you're 95% sure that uh, there'll be a traffic jam on Osa Road today or something like that. It may be based on empirical data. In some cases, you can actually verify this by you know, going on 100 days and looking at Hosa Road. In some cases, uh, it's rather hard. And since I told you I come from astronomy, this is felt most acutely in the domain of uh, cosmology when you study the whole universe. You make some measurements. Then you say with 95% uh, probability, the rate of expansion of the universe is between these two numbers. Now, most people make such statements. They are published in journals. but uh, you cannot collect a sample of 100 universes and see whether you know, 95% of them behave in this way and the others don't. So by the time you come to some of the applications of uh, uh, statistics and probability, the meaning subtly shifts to your degree of belief. Okay? And uh, the conventional uh, definitions really uh, don't work. Right. I told you uh, at the beginning that uh, most practical problems do not involve a strict passage from you know, premises to conclusions, which is sort of unique. More often, we look at the evidence and try to go back to what could be the possible explanations for that evidence. And that goes by the name of induction, at least. That's what I thought. I asked Indrani, and she told me perhaps abduction is a better word. Okay. So actually, Sherlock Holmes, though he kept saying that he practiced the science of deduction, actually would look at cigarette ash, footprints, you know, various kinds of handwriting, and go back and say, you know, that guy you know, is the murderer or something like that. So it is really an example of induction, not the other way around. So how does this work? Okay. So now, uh, it means you have to go beyond the usual concept of probability. It can't just be frequency. 
frequency meaning counting the number of successes by the total number of trials. So I have three quotes, one from Bayes, whom we'll see later. It's actually, you have to translate the English a bit because it is 1763 English. So let's try. The probability of any event is the ratio between the value at which the expectation depending on the happening of that event ought to be computed. The ratio between that and the value of the thing expected upon its happening. So if, I think, so my understanding is that he says, if you win the lottery, you get one lakh, all right? But let's say the probability of your winning is one in one lakh, then the correct price of a lottery ticket is one rupee. <laughs> That's what he's really telling you in this rather convoluted sentence, which is interesting. He's defining probability in terms of human expectations, <laughs> okay? And you might worry that it's a somewhat subjective definition. But this is not his, his main contribution, by the way. We will see his contribution. Uh, Laplace, the famous astronomer, mathematician, and probabilist, took this up, and uh, he laid out these rules more formally, and said, look, this is common sense applied to calculation. And James, whom I told you about, the most passionate advocate of Bayesian thinking, says it's simply an extension of normal logic, extension to the case where we are not certain, and it's a set of uniquely consistent rules, so it's a strong claim, essentially saying that all the others are not doing it right, Okay, for conducting interference, uh, inference. And plausible reasoning, because it's never going to reach, uh, give you certainty, but it's going to give you probabilities. And uh, this is the book in which he said it. Now I'll have to ask for your, I want to get a little more into what this Bayesian thinking is. Okay, And for that, I'm going to ask your patience and indulgence for what might look like a complete digression. Okay, okay. So this is... <laughs> This is Bayes, this is the only picture of him that you can find. He's a reverend, so he has this proc and so on. Uh, so let's take the 100 students of the undergraduate program and uh, let us ask them their preference for fruit, not preference. Let's just ask them whether they like jackfruit, which is denoted by H, or whether they like uh, pomegranates, which is denoted by D, okay? So the data I'm giving you is that 60% uh, like uh, jackfruit, P of H, 30% like pomegranates, and uh, these are not exclusive. So 15% of the total population, which means 15 students, actually like both, okay? So, uh, achha, it's probably, is it conventional to point to these things? Uh, let me see if I can do that. Yeah, I can, actually. Is, is this visible? Yeah, quite easily visible, okay, right? So in fact, the total of these is not 60 plus 30. That would be 90, but you have to subtract this 15. Which, so there are 75 students. The remaining 25 don't like either, so we are not worrying about them. So now, uh, one can ask the following question. First, select the people who like uh, pomegranates, which is D, okay? So the red circle. And ask what fraction of them like Jackfruit, which means what fraction like both, okay? Uh, so this is the notation. You draw a vertical line and whatever is to the right is the condition that you're given. So you don't have to worry. You concentrate on the people who like pomegranates and then you ask what's the probability of their liking uh, jackfruit. And the answer here is you have, uh, let's see, 30 of these and only 15 of these, so the probability is 0.5. But if you ask the same question, Look at all the people who like the jackfruit, H, okay? And uh, what fraction of them like pomegranates? That fraction is different because it's 15 divided by 60, okay? So 15 divided by 60 is 0.25, right? So this is essentially Bayes' theorem, okay? I have not written out the theorem, but I hope uh, these definitions uh, make sense to you, okay? Uh, these are technically called conditional probabilities. P of H is not a conditional probability. Just take the total population, how many like jackfruit, okay? By the way, none of you asked me why I use these strange letters for jackfruit and pomegranate. Any, any guesses? Yeah, Dalimbe and this is Halsin Hannu. <laughs> right, <laughs> okay. So what, so it turns out therefore that this 15% can be calculated in two ways, okay? You can take first 
P of H, which is 0 0.6 and then multiplied by 0.25, right? Or you can take 0.3 and multiply it by 0.5. Okay. And these two ways must give the same answer. They're just two different ways of doing the same calculation. So I hope with uh, all this uh, softening up, this does not intimidate you too much. <laughs> this is the actual base theorem. So it says, first, take the fraction who like uh, jackfruit. And of that fraction, find out how many like uh, the pomegranate. Or you can take the pomegranate, fraction who like pomegranate, and multiply the fraction of those who like jackfruit. Okay. So let's put this aside. As I said, I wanted your patience because the relevance to our subject may not be obvious. So let's put it in a little bit of astronomy now and history. Uh, this is an event which excited as much excitement as the recent discovery of gravitational waves did. But this is uh, New Year's Day 1801, where uh, a new object was discovered in the solar system uh, by astronomers with telescopes. It's a minor planet, which goes by the name of uh, Ceres. Okay? Of course, this is a beautiful picture of Ceres taken with a very sophisticated telescope in the 20th century. But at that time, it was just a dot of light. And of course, being a planet, it moves in the sky. Earth is also moving. So very soon after these gentlemen found the planet, it disappeared behind the sun. In other words, it was only visible in the daytime, and it could not be studied. So I had just a very limited number of observations. I have put six points, hmm? the position in the sky and the time. So it kept moving in the sky. And then after a few months, it again became visible. If it was visible in the evening, now it became visible in the morning. Unfortunately, if they didn't know the orbit of the planet, they didn't know where to look. So they would have to start searching all over again. Okay. So they were saved from this <laughs> difficulty by this great mathematician. In fact, some people would simply say the greatest mathematician. No <laughs> qualification, called Gauss. Okay. So he came up with uh, the following idea. Of course, he knew how to compute orbits, but he didn't know what the orbit of this was. So he had to try many orbits. So if you, if you guess what the orbit is, it will predict for you a curve like that. And you can ask, do the observations agree with this curve? Now, observations have errors. Now, error is also something that Gauss understood. In fact, uh, there is this curve which I'm sure everyone has heard of. It's called the Bell Curve, <laughs> or otherwise the Gaussian distribution. People like Galton had already seen that the distribution of people's heights or IQ mysteriously seem to follow this distribution. Interestingly, the number of heads in a large number of coin tosses also follows this distribution. Okay. And that's why it was given the name normal distribution. It's almost as if it's abnormal if something doesn't follow it. Okay. In any case, the errors of astronomical observations do seem to follow this. Okay. So uh, the approach which Gauss suggested was the following. You can draw many such curves. How do you pick one of them? So what you do is, once you choose a curve, once you choose an orbit, each point, you have an error. So this one, the error is positive, represented by this small arrow. This one, the error is large and negative, represented by the next arrow, and so on. Right? So these are all the errors. And presumably, the errors fall on this bell curve. Now, suppose I drew some orbit which is completely off, like that. These errors would be much bigger. And therefore, they would lie in the region where the probability was rather small. So what he proposed is, Let's multiply all the probabilities of all these curves, okay, and keep choosing the curve so that we ultimately end up with the best possible curve, right? Which maximizes the probability that these errors could have occurred. Okay. Now, I have actually, it doesn't need a great mathematician to say this, but <laughs> I have simplified his work. What he came up with is, of course, a set of formulae by which this could be done quickly and automatically, and he himself did the calculations as well, and told these people, OK, go and look here. <laughs> and they looked there, and they found the planet. Okay? But uh, the principle he introduced today is called the principle of least squares. So again, skipping a little step, whatever I told you of multiplying all these probabilities on the bell curve is equivalent to saying, take this error and square it. Take this error and square it. Now, the effect of squaring is important because whether it's positive or negative, after squaring it becomes positive. And then you add all those squares, and uh, 
then choose that curve which minimizes it. And this is something that people have done ever since. Okay. So if you ask what's the underlying principle behind least squares, it is the principle that make a guess as to what the answer is, calculate the probability that if this answer is true, you would have got these observations. The observations are what you really have in your hand. And then choose that solution which will maximize this probability. So if you, now of course Gauss was a very great man, but uh, there is uh, something missing in this logic. Okay? And uh, that is the real theme of uh, Bayesian inference and so on. And it's a crucial distinction, so let me make it. So what Gauss was really calculating was, uh, ah, so now I should tell you what D and H really stand for. D stands for data and H stands for hypothesis. Okay. <laughs> right? so, so, uh, now what Gauss was calculating was, given a hypothesis, that is given an orbit, what is the probability that the data will be whatever we observe? Okay. Now is that what you really want? Because you also have the other conditional probability, which is given the data, which is the most probable hypothesis? And the two are not the same. And the simple illustration I can give you is the following. Just as the two probabilities condition, okay, so let me just uh, go back a little bit. These two conditional probabilities were not the same, right? PDH was 0.25 because this common region occupied only a quarter of this big circle, whereas PHD was 0.5 because the same common region occupied half of this circle. Or a more illustration closer to uh, recent events in Bangalore, if you receive a phishing message in your offering you millions of dollars, the probability that it comes from a Nigerian is very, very high. On the other hand, if you meet a Nigerian on the street, it doesn't mean that he is one of the guys who sends out those phishing messages. So I hope that uh, the distinction between PhD and nothing to do with the doctorate <laughs> and PDH is sufficiently clear to you. So it appears that even a man as great as Gauss actually said he took the hypothesis to be given and calculated the probability of getting this data. So modern statisticians call this a likelihood. It's the likelihood of getting this data. And he maximized the likelihood, and people continue to maximize the likelihood to this day. Okay? However, what the Bayesian school says is, this is not right. Okay? So, now to give you an idea of the landscape of statistics, after, Pierce, after uh, Galton, there was Pearson, there were Fisher, lots of people. In, and they developed the sampling theory. So, for example, you know, you, you might go to an election constituency and uh, you might take a sample and find that, uh, let us say, you know, 60% of the people in your sample uh, vote for a particular party, let us say Congress or something like that. And then what you would really like to know is what is the probability, what's the most probable value of the fraction of Congress in the full population? Now, what the sampling theory will tell you the opposite. They'll tell you if there is 60%, in the constituency, then you might get 60%, or you might get 30%, or you might get 80%, depending on what your sample is. So it's a very good theory if you are given one population and you take many samples. So this is what happens in applications like quality control, opinion polls, and so on. Okay? However, in situations like cosmology, it's the other way around. You have one sample, and you may never get more, or it may be very difficult to get more then you should really take the Bayesian point of view. right? So these two points basically tell you conventional statistics. And the question raised by the Bayesians, I mean, not by Bayes and Laplace himself, because as I said, the whole issue died, but raised in the 20th century is, look at it the other way. You have a unique set of data, and you should be maximizing, you should be finding that hypothesis which is the most likely. So now again, I'll have to backtrack a little bit. So let's uh, go to this theorem. So now ignore everything else. And the quantity we really want is given the data. So this D is given to the right of this line, which, what is the probability of different hypotheses? And then you can either pick, pick the one which is most probable if you like. Okay? Now what the base theorem tells you is that Gauss was not completely wrong when he computed this likelihood. 
What he told you is, if the true orbit is something, what's the probability of getting the observations which you observed, okay? But then you have to correct it with the second factor. And this is what has been responsible for the huge controversy. So what is the second factor? It's the probability of this hypothesis, unconditional, so without data. So that's why it's called the prior, okay? So if you want to embrace the religion of uh, Bayesianity, you have to believe in something called, in any problem, you have to believe in something called a prior. Okay? Now in the case of information theory, there was a prior. So Shannon assumed that, uh, say, texts which were transmitted uh, came from English and they had certain statistics and therefore you could compute the number of bits and so on. Now the notion of a prior may be more controversial and that's the reason for this uh, schism in the statistics community. Okay. However, the simple, that's the reason why I introduced Bayes theorem in a context which is free from controversy. It tells you that just by pure logic, if at all you ever want to calculate this P of HD, right, given data, how to compare different hypotheses, the only, and compare them at the level of probability, you ha cannot escape this prior. Okay? So now, I'll put the controversy aside. We've been through this. So I'll tell you in a practical way how Bayesian works. We had these two factors, right? So uh, this uh, dashed line is a prior. And see, the prior is really rather broad. Okay? But it still tells you that even before you collected the data, you had some idea. So this corresponds to the notion that you never, you may approach a question with an open mind, but you do not approach it with an empty mind. So your prior, for example, might say that, look, it's highly unlikely that, you know, based on whatever you knew earlier, that uh, the percentage of voters of this, you know, is going to be 100%. So you may put some limits, and you may put a broad curve on that, okay? So this is uh, the prior. Then this is the likelihood, which multiplies it, the dotted line. And when you multiply it, you get an even narrower curve. And that is what is called the posterior, which means the final result of your inference process, which includes your prior notions and includes the data. Okay? So this is the way the Bayesian methodology works. Now, one could go more and more into philosophical issues and so on. Uh, but I will just, at this point, uh, switch to a few examples. Okay? Uh, just one example, in fact, and this is from work which I did with a colleague many, many years ago. We did follow it up, but okay, now is this uh, legible? Not very, but I'll read it to you. Uh, it's from the Journal of Astrophysics and Astronomy, 1982, so a long time ago. It says, maximum entropy image reconstruction, a practical non-information theoretic approach. So that's me and uh, my colleague Ramesh Narayan, who is now in Harvard. And you can see from the received date and the accepted date, which is April and September, that we had a, quite a bit of fight with the referees. Okay. Now, the reason why I put it is not so much to advertise what we did, but to advertise the opposite. That at that time, which was many, many years ago, I was generally not convinced by this Bayesian or information theoretic approach. And we actually put it into the title of the paper. But with thinking about the matter some more, I'm convinced not that what we did in the paper is wrong, but the title is wrong. <laughs> so what we did in the paper ultimately was to explore different priors. Okay, I mean, okay. So let me uh, let me just give you a very. Uh, so what do you mean by image reconstruction? Well, you only have to reconstruct something if someone else has destroyed it, okay, or at least deconstructed it. <laughs> so in the case of an astronomical, you have an object. And then when you observe it with a telescope which has some limited capabilities, uh, the kind of picture which you get uh, reflects the performance of the telescope. So it's not the ideal picture, okay? So this is this non-ideal picture. I should explain what these lines are. Um, these do dotted lines are actually uh, uh, negative values which are unphysical. Uh, and this is a bit like a map of a hill. So as you come up here, this is the brightest point. And uh, then, so you have some astronomical object which is extended like this, and there may or may not be an object here. So this is what you would call a raw image, before you have applied any Bayesian ideas to it. Now again, skipping all technical details, 
if you use this notion of entropy as a prior, you end up with this. Now, at a practical level, it looks much nicer. You are able to actually see there are two peaks here. You are able to see that there is another source here which is much weaker, which got lost. So at a practical, I mean, this is a thing which many people did and we explored it quite extensively. So we were not actually criticizing the method. If anything, we were trying to understand when it works and when it doesn't work. Okay. Now, of course, a good question you may ask is, how do you know that this is the correct source, that you have really reconstructed it? Um, so there you cheat. What you do is take a source which you know because you created it. Then in the computer, degrade it, throw away some information, <laughs> and see whether this Bayesian inference will give you back that information. And if it does so in a variety of cases, it gives you some confidence that even when you apply it to the case of a source which you observe, where you don't know what the true source is, the Bayesian approach is taking you closer to the truth. There's no absolute truth in this business, by the way. Okay. So, I mean, I've just given you a glimpse of one piece of work which we did long ago, but uh, we are hardly the only ones. Uh, today, it's extensively used to process images. It's also extensively used to estimate uncertainties. So, for example, I told you about the expansion of the universe, which in some units, uh, people were uncertain. When I started doing astronomy, it was anywhere between 50 and 100. And then as new data came in, uh, it kept narrower. And now today, people will tell you that it is between 70 and 73. Okay. One of the nice things about Bayesian thing is that as new data comes in, your estimate automatically keeps improving. Or if you like, whatever uh, probability distribution you got over your uh, hypotheses or your parameters uh, can be taken as the prior for the next thing. Okay, so now I come to the last part, which is I, what I call jumping off the deep end, which is attempts by people to push these ideas well beyond the practical realm of statistical inference. The first one is actually predates Shannon. So if you take a hot body, like say, uh, the air in this room, a physicist will tell you that it has some 10 to the 28 molecules, but no physicist will be able to tell you exactly what each individual molecule is doing. Nevertheless, with great confidence, <laughs> I tell you that the air fills the room uniformly, it exerts the same pressure on all the walls. Where does this confidence come from? It comes from a branch of physics called statistical physics. And uh, in some sense, the problem faced by a statistical physicist is similar. You know what makes up, you know a few things. I, I know the total number of molecules, I know the total energy they have because I know the temperature, okay? And then I have some prior in mind, the way that molecules are more likely to behave, okay? And then I find that I can actually make sensible predictions about other properties, like, for example, the pressure on the walls or many other properties. And these predictions are borne out by experiment. And uh, in th the word entropy actually comes from thermodynamics. So uh, let me very, let me give a very brief account of it. Entropy is really disorder. Okay. So I can think of a state in which all the molecules are in your half of the room and not in mine. Okay. And that is considered a more orderly state than the molecules filling the whole room. I think people who uh, move from a smaller house to a bigger house know this. You, you lose things better in a bigger house. It's harder to find. There's more disorder, more entropy. And uh, the calculation of entropy according to the recipe given by, uh, in fact, another physicist whose picture I didn't bring along, Boltzmann, really follows the Shannon calculation, except that he had his own prior, and the information is now information about molecules. Okay. Now, this was just an analogy, right? That physicists want information about molecules, but uh, communication engineers want information about uh, messages. But that analogy has actually become uh, deeper. Okay. It's become deeper in a very interesting way. Um, how do you know something is uh, disordered? Right? Or let's take the same example of uh, molecules on two sides of a room, where we say that the more disorderly state is when the molecules fill the whole room. The orderly state is when they fill half the room. So it's, in fact, the great physicist Maxwell who proposed the following experiment, thought experiment. You put a wall, put a small hole in the wall, and next to the hole, you have something which is called Maxwell's demon. 
So Maxwell's demon looks at the molecules, and if a molecule is going from right to left, it opens the gate. If it's going from left to right, it closes the gate. So gradually, in spite of the random motion of molecules, you accumulate all the molecules on the left side. So you seem to have reversed the normal course of things in which the molecules would spread from half the container to the full container. How would you do this? Okay. And this remained as a kind of paradox because it's never observed in nature. And it was ultimately removed only in the 20th century where other physicists thought about it and said, look, this demon is not something supernatural. Let's assume that it's also made of molecules. So how is it going to make these observations? So in the process of separating these random molecules and getting them all on one side, the demon has made all these measurements and written them down. So now you have a long string of ones and zeros. So all the entropy has gone from the gas into this string of ones and zeros. So the two notions of entropy, Shannon's notion and the physicist's notion of something disorderly have actually got unified. And then this was taken a step further by scientists in IBM who said, uh, you have a computer. We think it gives you information, right? You ask it a question and it gives you an answer. Uh, now, interestingly, uh, why do computers get hot? <laughs> okay. So that way they are increasing the disorder in their surroundings. Is that essential? Or could we have computers which could function without drawing power and without discharging heat to the surroundings? So two computer scientists in the 1960s actually concluded that one of the very important functions in a computer is the erasure of information. <laughs> okay. Well, imagine you had a computer which did not erase information. What would happen? You would do today's calculation, tomorrow's calculation, day after tomorrow's calculation. They would all accumulate in the computer. Okay. And you might do all kinds of random calculations. So you would have this huge store of random numbers in the computer, okay. uh, which you keep accumulating. Now, our computers don't work like that. Right? So what you do is you have to get rid of these numbers. To get rid of these numbers, you have to erase it. And the process of erasing the information actually generates heat, believe it or not. Okay. So what is interesting and is the synthesis that the uh, information contained in messages, which is what Shannon thought about, the randomness contained in heat, which is what Boltzmann thought about, are now getting merged. And the last and most speculative is that there is a randomness which has nothing to do with temperature, uh, which is associated with uncertainty. If you take the electron in the hydrogen atom, it's been realized from 1930s that you cannot pin down exactly where it is and where it is going. It's a kind of cloud. And uh, so this is fundamental. And various people, including Einstein, said, well, maybe you know, this is not fundamental. And so there's some deeper thing which we are missing, which will tell us what these electrons are really doing. No one has found it. So now there is a philosophy called quantum Bayesianism, an abbreviated cubism. Okay? And uh, I find it a bit scary, but it is quite current in the physics literature. You can just Google cubism if you like. And what they are saying is, this is fundamental. So you don't say that the world consists of electrons, atoms, etc. You say the world consists of our knowledge of electrons, atoms. Now, the difficulty is why are you privileging human beings? So of course, people are working on it. So if they succeed, they will tell you that uh, the electron also knows something about you. <laughs> you know? Now, this, is, this looks bizarre. Okay? Nevertheless, people have been forced to such extreme views by the phenomena which occur at the quantum world. So I'd just like to leave you with that. That clearly would be the topic of another talk. And uh, I didn't know words like ontology and epistemology till I came to APU two years ago. But uh, in any case, quantum Bayesianism seems to be saying, I mean, one of the proponents coined the slogan, it from bit. <laughs> bit is information, and it is something which exists. Right? So I, 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 want to, I don't want to leave you, with, uh, leave you at the deep end. So let's get back to something more practical. Oh, no, I seem to have lost my last thing, which was really nothing. It was a take home. So uh, many of you will use statistics. So if you want to embarrass your statistical collaborator, you can ask, are you a Bayesian or are you a frequentist? OK? And I don't know what answer you will get. And uh, I would say that it's actually worth, it turns out that, I mean, I have tried to make this as non-technical as possible. But those who are interested in getting a little more technical, the interesting thing, and which is, is that beyond a point, 
uh, it really consists of computer programs. So many of these things are actually invisible to us. It's still important to know what is the input which goes into these computer programs. Okay. So in fact, my two biology colleagues, uh, uh, Shomain and Jayanti, have been pushing me to you know, tell them something about Bayesian, simply because when they read biology papers, people say, we use the Bayesian method in order to conclude that such, such an animal prefers to be in such and such a forest after dark and prefers to go into the field. You know, so <laughs> clearly, although the issues may seem esoteric, the applications are quite practical. Okay, so uh, so I think uh, this is my point to thank you for uh, taking this adventure of listening to something which I was told that my abstract was a little too abstract. <laughs> I hope it's been a little more concrete now. And I've this has not been a typical seminar in the sense I haven't told you all about the work I have done. But I think it's an interesting field which I have worked on, I'm interested in, and which may be of interest to many of you. So, so thanks very much. I know it, there's at least one Bayesian in Kengeri, <laughs> in the ISI. So. But in some sense, if you believe in probability at all, and if your final aim is to compare different hypotheses, saying this is more probable than the other, at least I think that you are forced to something like a Bayesian view. Now you may ask, are the rivals very stupid? No, they are not stupid. I mean, for example, one of the greatest statisticians that India has ever produced, C.R. Rao, I think uh, has mainly worked on the frequentist side. So their philosophy is a little different. You have some data, you are interested in some parameter, we'll give you something called an estimator, which will give you the value of that parameter. Okay? A simple example is if you want to know the average, add up everything and divide by the total number. But that's the simplest example of an estimator. And they will put various constraints on this estimator and find out what is the best estimator. So this estimation theory is uh, the other camp. 